that's such a pastor thing to do. So. It's good to see you guys this morning. I also want to say thank you to Rodney, who's back here, who is so used to doing the message focus every week. He said, okay, I'm ready. And I said, yeah, not this week, you're not. And he's like, huh? So anyway, but Rodney, I want to thank you for all you do all the time. We appreciate you. We're just really blessed with some awesome people. And if it wasn't for Randy, none of you would be watching online right now. So actually, I'd probably be doing this, right? If you look, if you look back really far back, you'll see. I literally just used to put a camera in the middle. It was so bad. And you could hear people, like if their phone rang or if they were talking to their neighbor, that was what you'd hear instead of me. So there'd be somebody in there like, you want to go for pizza? You know, or whatever during church. So anyway, thankfully now you can only hear me say that. So um, do you ever have a security blanket as a kid? For those of you who don't know, my daughter, lit, this is one of her blankets, but it's not mine, I promise. And, but, um, but my daughter Lydia has blankets and she loves to carry a blanket. We went to the movies this week, we went and saw Wonka and I can recommend that. It's a very family kid movie. Did you see it? I loved it. Did you love it? My wife wouldn't like it, but I loved it. I'm weird um, and I like musicals anyway, so you know, that's a real shocker for anybody who knows me. There's no business. Come on, sing along. Uh, Noah's like, I'm not even going to pay attention to you. But anyway, so, but Lydia, we went to the movies and she brings her blanket with her um, everywhere she goes, like a security blanket. And in the story we're going to look at today about blind Bartimaeus, there's a kind of a discussion, and I think that it's true. Bartimaeus, once Jesus calls him, he leaves. It says he left his garment, and it doesn't really make sense because it's not like he left his garments. Um, he left his garment is what it says, and he came to Jesus. And here's what they think, and, and I tend to believe this um, because I think it's been shown in history is when someone was a beggar in the time of Christ, they would have a begging blanket. And basically, they would lay their blanket down, and they would sit. And it, you kind of think of it as a guitar player who puts a hat out. Um, why does a guitar player put their hat out? Dave knows it's to get change, right, Dave? So other people can get change. No, a guitar player puts a hat out. Why? Asking for donations. A beggar would put their blanket out to ask for donations. And then at the end of the day, they would gather their blanket and gather the money that was given in their blanket and go home with their blanket. And their blanket was their begging blanket. It was their way of income. Here's what I want you to do this year. As we look at this story today, I want you to think about your quiet time. I want you to think about those moments in your life where you're overwhelmed or you're seeking an answer from God or like the sermon title says, you need a miracle. And my hope this week is as we talk about Bartimaeus that you'll think of yourself as a person who needs to wait on God and that you take your blanket and you just take time every day to wait on Him, whether you need healing, whether you need to deal with an answer, God, I need an answer from you, whether you need direction, whether you're overwhelmed. You know, sometimes when we're overwhelmed, we do more activity instead of less. And there's truthfully time in our lives that we just need to stop and wait. And so if you don't get anything else out of this, Bob, if you need to take a nap, I'm going to give you the sermon so you can... Tell Mary later that, yes, I was listening because I know that the point of the sermon was sit and wait for Jesus. So now you can nap. But the truth is, that's really what this story is about. It's not even about as much him knowing his identity. Some, some people have made this into a story about him knowing his identity. I'm like, I don't think that's what it's about. It's just about a guy who knew Jesus could heal him. But he knew he had to wait on him. Now, are you an impatient person? How many of you would call yourself an impatient person? All right. How many in here would call their spouse an impatient person? Okay, now we know the truth, right? So I remember, I grew up in Miami. And for those of you who don't know, I learned how to drive in Miami. 
I always joke with my classmates that anyone who learned how to drive in Miami and goes somewhere else to live should apologize to everyone around them for their driving. And so I try to constantly remind you of that. And I use a lot of driving illustrations because as a kid, my dad was a full-time driving instructor. Now that was not his job, but it was his job. Did any of you have a dad like that who was constantly telling you how to, yes, I believe that about Bill, all right? So, so my dad, con I, mean, I mean, literally, I was barely old enough to see out the window, and my dad was always constantly instructing us on how to drive. And sometimes that instruction instead involved, oh, it was pastoral skills, encouraging other people that couldn't hear him. Go, go, go. This is how impatient my dad was. I remember sitting in turn lanes in Miami, and every single time my dad would count the number of cars that made it through the intersection because it was always somebody not, and this was before cell phones, they were not paying attention. And my dad, come on, we're never going to make it out of here. And sure enough, that three people would go, and then somebody was whatever, and finally they would go, and my dad would go, four cars, four cars. So one day, we were on US-1, and at this place on US-1, it was four lanes at that time on each side, plus a turn lane, so ten lanes total. And we were sitting at this light, and the light turned green, the turn lane, people went, 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 and then it went to flashing yellow, flashing yellow turn lane, and this person at the front of the line decided they could go and went one lane and then decided they couldn't go. So they blocked one lane of traffic and stopped. Well, thankfully, that car that came up stopped, but all the other cars were still going. And this is Miami, so they don't believe in speed limits, traffic lights, or anything else. And so people are going, 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 and my dad starts saying, don't go, just wait. Don't go, just wait. And of course, I'm in the car with him, probably 12 years old, unable to drive, but learning everything I need to know. And I'm watching this car, all the excitement happening as cars buzz by, and this guy sits. This guy then decides he's going to go one more lane. He goes one more lane. The second car stops. I'm like, oh, wow, he made it. And my dad's going, don't go, wait. There's still two more lanes, two more lanes. Wait for the light to change. Well... The guy got impatient. He decided, I can go one more lane. And he pulled up, and the person didn't see him, and hit the front of that car. And I'll never forget watching that car as it spun around and hit three cars waiting at the light on the left side. There were now like five cars already involved in the accident. And of course, my dad did what my dad always did, and we got out of there and went home as quick as we could. Now, you need to understand something about Miami, too. You'd have an accident, and the police would not show up. Now, it's very different than here. Here, I'll never forget, one night, I called. Uh, uh, we had somebody break into a car. I called the police. They came with dogs and tracked the person down. I never in my life had that. My sister had somebody in her driveway breaking into her car and banging on her door. She called the police. They stole her car and left. She called the police and they said, did they leave? She said, yes. She said, they said, file a report on a weekday down at the office later. Never even came to the house. Very different, whole different rules in Miami. Now, my dad made this a life principle for me. He said, as he saw that car get wiped out, he said, son, remember, it is better to wait than get the slop knocked out of you. That's exactly what he said. Now, I think he PG'd it for me, but there it was. He said, better to wait than to get the slop knocked out. And he would say it over and over again. We'd be doing something, and he'd go, son, remember, Better to wait. Because in Miami, we saw accidents all the time, all the time, all the time. And it almost always was somebody who got a little impatient and went a little too early. Can I tell you a life skill that we all need? And I hope you'll learn from this story today. We have got to learn to wait on Jesus. So many of us, as we deal with struggles and we deal with answers for something or we're trying to find satisfaction in our life, we begin looking for other things and we get in a hurry for God to move and we jump out. And then we get the slop knocked out of us, right? And so today we're going to look at this story and we're going to look at Mark chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, it also uh, should be in your bulletin also. And I want to talk today about sitting 
and waiting for Jesus. So we're going to look at three things. Number one, are you willing to endure? I don't know of anybody who loves waiting. And isn't it funny how, depending on where you're at, you'll wait longer or less long? Like, you'll go to a restaurant that's, like, awesome, and it'll be 45 minutes before they deliver your food, and you're like, oh, it's so worth it. If you went to a McDonald's drive through and it took 45 minutes, you would leave and get mad. It's just amazing how different things. And so here's what happens in this story. They came to Jericho, Mark 10, picking up in verse 46. They came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind Bartimaeus. By the way, there's, there's very few people Jesus healed that are named. This is one of the few that are named in Scripture where Jesus heals them. Why? Many theologians think it's because people knew who Bartimaeus was. When this was written later on, people said, oh, well, we, we've met Bartimaeus. We've heard him tell this story which means son of Timaeus, he was sitting by a roadside begging. Now, Roman roads in those days, you can imagine who all he listened to, who all he heard go by. So he heard political leaders go by. He heard Roman soldiers go by. He heard politicians go by. He heard celebrations go by. He heard funerals go by. But we don't hear that he called out for politicians to help him. By the way, one of the biggest cautions I have nowadays and my fear for the church is too many people who think that politics are their savior instead of Jesus. And I want that to be the biggest caution I can give you as an election year comes up is don't trust in a politician to save you. I want you to vote, but I don't want you to trust them to save you. Don't mix those two things up or you'll be in a lot of trouble. And so he's sitting at the roadside, and what happens next is awesome. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. A couple things here. Number one was, he was out loud proclaiming who Jesus was, that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the chosen one. Also, you could tell that he had read the scriptures. One of the things I will tell you about waiting for God is spend time in God's Word. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit will recall everything God said. And here's the truth. You'll read the Bible. You may not remember that devotion. Maybe some of you read your Bible early this morning. And now if I said, what did you read about? You'd go, oh, I don't know. But the truth is, as you read God's word and his word empowers you, that the Holy Spirit will sometimes out of nowhere bring back maybe a portion of scripture or something for you to remember or something to encourage you or inspire you. And so he says, son of David, have mercy on me. He's proclaiming who Jesus was. And then he continues, many rebuked him. Isn't that awesome? By the way, earlier in this passage, the disciples rebuked people. They rebuked the children. They were, people were bringing their children to Jesus, and the disciples said, Don't bother Jesus. You're bothering him. And let me tell you something I know, and this is the same way. When you have a need, when you have a hurt, sometimes it's easy to think, but other people have a bigger hurt. Other people have a bigger problem. But here's the deal. You ready? When you pray, I want you to remember, when, when you lay down your pallet to pray, <laughs> and, and it doesn't have to be a literal pallet, obviously, but when you sit down to pray, you're not bothering Jesus. So they told him to be quiet. Many rebuked him, said, be quiet. And he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Is there anything or anyone you've quit praying for? Because you felt like, well, I guess it's not worth it. I am sure there were other blind men that sat with Bartimaeus. Maybe even some went home that morning. Maybe some gave up the day before. Bartimaeus could have given up an hour before, a few minutes before. And the truth is, many times, right before God moves in our lives, it's the darkest time in our life. It's the hardest time. 
It's the biggest struggle. And so I want to encourage you, if you're going through something right now and you're looking for an answer from God or peace from God, say, God, I know you haven't answered yet. I don't know what I'm supposed to do right now. But would you speak to my heart? By the way, one of the things I would encourage you to do when it comes to Scripture, and this will change your life. If you've never spent a lot of time in the Bible, or when you read the Bible, maybe your Bible studies feel dry and you feel like it's just educational maybe, I want to encourage you to take a story like this and put yourself in the story. As you read it, maybe you would say, what would it be like to be blind Bartimaeus? What would I hear? What would, what would I smell? What would, what would be going... By the way, if he's sitting on the roadside in a Roman city, that's not great. What would, what would be going on? Or maybe you put yourself in the place of the crowd saying, Bartimaeus, quit yelling! Maybe you put yourself in the place of one of the disciples who's standing there going, who is that yelling? Why are they yelling so loud? If you'll take time to put yourself in a passage and let God speak to you, it's amazing how the Bible will come to life in your life. As we go into a new year, I want to encourage you, don't just read the Bible like you're reading a history book. Put yourself there and recognize that God can use Scripture to change you if you'll let Him. Number two, Will you seek Jesus? Remember, the whole idea is to sit and wait for Christ. And, and the truth is, we're all impatient. We're all impatient. We, we all have left a restaurant or left a place of business after we got tired of waiting. Some of us are such bad drivers that we don't like to wait for the left turn arrow, so we go straight and then do a U-turn. How many of you have ever done that? By the way, that's a skill you have to do in, in New Orleans. New Orleans does not have left turns. Did you know that? In New Orleans, you have to go straight and then do a U-turn. They try to tell you, they're, they're trying to show you that you should never U-turn. I don't know what they're trying to tell you. No left turn. So all the UPS drivers do right turns all over the city. It's very exciting. Some of us get impatient on God. And listen to what happens one of the things that happens in our lives is not only do we get impatient for Christ, we look for other things to satisfy us. Maybe we can't deal with our emotions, so we look to alcohol or we look to drugs. Or we don't feel fulfilled, so we look for others to fill up our needs. And maybe we even look to politicians and say, well, they're going to fill all my needs. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to laugh. And so there blind Bartimaeus sits. And here's what it said. Jesus, verse 49, stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man. I love this. Cheer up. And it's like, how was he yelling that they told him to cheer up? He must have been like upset yelling. It says, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. And then it says, throwing his cloak aside... He jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. And I love this. What do you want me to do? Jesus asked him. By the way, I can't imagine that Bartimaeus just was able to beeline it to Jesus. A blind man going through a crowd, I think, would have been noticeable. But here's the thing. Bartimaeus could have asked for anything. He simply said, Rabbi, I want to see. I love that he looks at Jesus with respect and says, Teacher, I just want to see. And what you'll notice is, what does he do? He throws aside anything that was hindering him. And the truth is, for some of us, we're seeking God, but we want to hang on to our stuff. Maybe it's a habit that we like. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's a hang-up. Maybe it's something that we just enjoy that we know that God doesn't want us to do. Maybe it's a relationship that's not right. And we hang on to it. And if we're going to get healing, we can't hang on to the old things. We have to set, even though it's painful and it makes you want to cry like Watson. We have to set those things aside. You know, Watson, just one sermon. Watson, are you doing okay? Oh, he's so cute.
Mom's like, oh. <laughs> Rabbi, I want to see. What do you have to throw aside? Maybe for you, that's the miracle you need. God, would you help me to throw my lust aside? God, would you help me to throw my pride aside? God, would you help me to throw aside this struggle and this relationship that I have? What is it in your life that you need to ask God, God, I need your help. I don't even want to put it aside. Would you help me to want to put this thing aside to follow you? Number three, will you follow Jesus? One of the cool things about Bartimaeus is what happens next. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight, and listen what he does, and followed Jesus along the road. Jesus said, you're healed, you can go, and Bartimaeus is like, I'm healed, and I'm following you. Because I know where the good stuff is. And I want to see what you're going to do next, now that I can see. And he follows Jesus. He didn't have to, but he did. Listen, when you follow Jesus, that's when joy comes. It doesn't mean life is easy. Life is hard. Things happen. I don't know what your 2024 has in store. Can you believe that? And that rhymed. Write that down. <laughs> I don't know what it has in store, but the truth is, God, I can walk with you. God, I can follow you so that no matter what comes, I know that you're with me. God, I want to set aside all the junk that I think is important, all the things that I think matter, all the things that I think are going to fulfill me. I set them aside in order to follow you. This year, as you spend time in God's Word, as you spend time in prayer, I want to encourage you to take time to wait for Jesus to pass by. Don't get in a hurry. Spend some time in God's word and let him speak to you through his word. Spend some time thanking him and praising him and allow him to touch your life. Don't get in such a hurry looking for an answer that you are running all the time and you never take time to wait. My favorite verse People ask me all the time, what's your favorite verse? And I say, Exodus 14, 14. It says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. And people say, why is that your favorite verse? I said, because I recognize how important it is to be quiet. And I recognize how hard a time I have being quiet. One of the hardest things in my life is being still. I know that's a shocker to some of you. My mom said it started nine months before I was born. And it hasn't stopped since. And the truth is, for all of us, whether it's outwardly or inwardly, we struggle at getting still. So I want to encourage you this year. Take some time every day. I don't care if it's five minutes. I don't care if it's 50 minutes. Take a few minutes and say, God, I'm just going to still my heart right now before you and wait for you. And if you do that, I believe that not only will he pass by, but he'll speak to your heart. Too many times we get in a hurry, but I want to encourage you this year, sit and wait for Jesus. We're going to pray, and then I have a closing song today. We're going to take our offering and um, just a simple song to end our service today. But would you join me as we pray? Father, thank you for this time today. I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your love for us. And Father, I know that I get impatient. Lord, I know sometimes I have a hard time waiting for you because I'm looking for what's next. I'm seeking answers. I'm wanting you to fulfill a need in my life. And Lord, I pray instead that I could sit and wait on you to know your presence in my life. Lord, thank you for this time today. In Jesus' name, amen.